Welcome along to this week's My Planet Rocks. And um, well, my guest tonight virtually needs no introduction after his performance on that opening track. Anyway, not only is he a bona fide rock guitar god from one of the most successful bands this country has ever produced, but he's also managed to squeeze in time to be a doctor of astrophysics, a CBE, a badger saver, author, and stereo photography expert, among loads of other things I probably haven't even mentioned. Welcome to My Planet Rocks. Brian May. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. Nice to be here. Wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you. I think we could probably do about a week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll just settle in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hope you brought some food. Um, but we've yeah. only got an hour, so we're going to talk about all sorts. Um, but before any of that, you have this incredible, I, I don't even want to call it a book because it's, it, I feel like I'm doing it a disservice if I just <laughs> say you've written this book. It's a toy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to say it properly. Diableries. Diableries, yes. okay. Well, that's a very, even that's a very English way of, of okay. saying it. You know, my partner Denis Pellerin would call it Diablerie. Okay. Without the S because the S is silent in French, of course. But Diableries is kind of devilments and that's what it's about. Um, it's about, well, you want me, you want me to tell you what it's about? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> More interesting if you say than I do. <laughs> it's easier when you have it in your hand, actually, isn't it? You know, mm -hmm. uh, rather than talking about it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it's, it's a 3D book and it's, what it does is channel images from the 1860s in France, which sounds very obscure, doesn't it? But actually it's very relevant to today because these images are all of devils and skeletons and, uh, and Satan himself, of course, all having a great time in hell. And these things were depicted for fun and for a little bit of a sort of religious overtone, but also more than anything, satirically and seditiously because they were all about overthrowing the government of their day so it's very relevant to today that's what i do you know i, I work on overthrowing governments <laughs> <laughs> and why uh, when i can you know in, in odd moments but these th these images have fascinated me for 40 years they're extraordinary they were made by sculptors and photographed in 3d and of course 3d in the 1860s was well advanced and anything that can be done in 3d was done by the 1860s the book comes with a st with a stereoscope my patent owl stereoscope so you get incredible 3d imaging very immersive even more than going to the cinema and seeing avatar i think really <laughs> <laughs> And we have every Diablery image in there except two, which we couldn't find. So there's 180 and there should be 182. But you can enjoy the experience. You can read it as a book because there's lots of research in there about mm. what these things actually mean because the devil is portraying Napoleon the third, in fact. And all these little things that they get up to. I mean, they get up to extraordinary things in hell. They, they do ice skating and, and yeah. firefighting and stuff. <laughs> the, the, but the, I actually, I'm ashamed to say, when I was going through the book, I genuinely don't think I knew anything about it. I was literally like, what the heck is this? Like, I, I really, I what, don't think it's in ever... Fact, what the hell is this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what the, yeah what the, exactly, literally. <laughs> but it's it's totally fascinating. I mean, yeah. what, what, what first, how did it first appear to you? Like, how did you get interested in it? It was years ago. I was a student and I used to go down Portobello Road and search for anything 3D. Cause it's always been a fascination of mine and I could pick up old viewers and things. And then suddenly in a pile of stereo cars was this one skeleton view. And I was fascinated from the beginning. I thought, what on earth is this? What is it saying? What, what was it made for? And then I realized it was a tissue. So you hold it up to the light and instead of it being black and white, it turns into glorious color and the eyes glow at you in a very mysterious way. So because the technology from the 1860s was incredible, actually. They painted these things on the back and pricked out all the eyes and all the jewellery and things that would glitter. And so when you hold it up to the light, it transforms from day into night. Wow. And <laughs> I tell you what, you, all this technology we have in the 21st century, I have tried to duplicate this, and you just can't. It's incredible that the work they put in. So I started collecting these things, I say 40 years ago, and now I have almost all of them, but not quite all of them. Mm. But I know people who have other ones, you know, so I've been able to scan everything. And of course, you use modern technology. Um, digital scanning and restoring in Photoshop, and you can restore these things to their former beauty. So you will see in this book the Diableries as they were meant to be seen in complete 3D and in colour. Um, and people just go, wow. It's great, you know, and I knew they would. I knew once we actually channeled this in the, into the 21st century, people would get excited, and they do seem to be. And it's almost like some, uh, it's it's a, a little bit like a, well, I suppose it is an underground secret, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah, I mean, 140 years, very, very little has been known about it. And uh, there's never been a book like this which, which 
gathered them all together. The secret is seeing them in 3D, in, in their stereoscopic mm -hmm. splendor, and that's why I had to design my own viewer to, to go with the book. I mean, it, you know, it looks beautiful, and when I, when I sort of got it out of its slipcase and I was looking through it, I kind of felt like it's not just a book, it's an experience. It's just so it fascinating, so fascinating, especially when, um, you know, I, like I said, I really wasn't aware of it at all, so it was um, genuinely, I was sat in the office being like, you did some work today. So, no, <laughs> hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I want you to pick a track. Uh, I'm not going to make it very difficult uh, at all. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to, uh, this time I won't ask you to pick one of yours. I'm just going to ask you to pick a really good guitar track by someone you think is, you know, worth it. Okay, what has popped into my head is Since You've Been Gone, because I think it's a quintessential, I suppose you'd call it pop rock in a sense, you know, but it, it it's uncompromising, you know, it's a great song and it's brilliantly played i mean the drums my dear friend cozy powell of course um long gone and i worked with him and it was a wonderful experience working with that guy i mean incredible he he, he had rock all the way through him you know an amazing guy and of course richie blackmore playing guitar who's extraordinary you know people don't talk about richie blackmore enough i don't know why but you know he was such a trailblazer and technically incredible unpredictable in every possible way which is great i mean that's that's what you love isn't it you go to a, a gig and you you want to see something which is not predictable which mm -hmm. is not like just you know reproducing something so you never knew what you're going to see when you went to see um purple when blackmore was in it but also rainbow when you know th this was his own thing and it was wild and dangerous and um this is a good pop record but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's great rock music in my opinion i think it's perfect <laughs> Rainbow on Planet Rock, and our very special guest this week is Mr. Brian May. Um, and Dr. Brian May. Do yeah. Actually, yeah, Dr. <laughs> Brian May. Oh. I don't let anybody call me Mr. these days. Yeah. If you go through that torture, you never want to be called Mr. Do you know what? <laughs> Lovely, let's do it again. <laughs> Dr. Brian May. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I, I did uh, mention, of course, before that the thing that we hold you all so dear to our hearts for is, is Queen. And um, very recently um, in Montreux, uh, you opened the, the Queen Studio Experience. Now, I didn't actually know anything about this until I read mm. about the opening, but tell us about it because it just sounds incredible. It's nice, yeah. It's something I never would have uh, thought would happen. You know, you go through these things. We used to turn up every day in Montreux. We loved it there. You know, it was it was a very good escape from sort of the pressures of of our home lives in london you know and we would be there working away going in the same door every day and then i went back there last week yeah, to open this studio experience and suddenly it's all it's sort of been converted into a museum in a sense you know <laughs> it's like being at your own funeral i'm trying to make it sound positive aren't i but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually a great thing you know we we worked there for many years and we actually made more or less six albums there in this little studio in the corner of a casino on the on the banks of lake geneva in a sleepy little town called montreux and montreux is is very quiet normally um you know a little bit of tourism goes on but when the jazz festival comes on it's it's massively crowded and nice actually it's a nice event to do. in fact kerry and i just played it this the last july and we have a dvd coming out of that performance which is nice but i digress we went there and um we stayed there david richards became our sort of um, regular engineer and producer and did a fantastic job so you, you you find a formula well not a formula but you find a situation which works for you mm. and you, you carry on with it freddie loved it because it enabled him to get away from the, the press intrusion particularly towards the end of his life uh you know because people were sticking uh, cameras through his toilet windows when he was when he was sick you know which is really awful mm. so in montreux he really did get peace and privacy and and he bought a place there and there we would work very i'm gonna say gently but it wasn't gentle <laughs> i suppose it, you know it was quite turbulent but um th there have been a trickle of people who go there like a pilgrimage i don't know if you know the freddie statue yeah is actually course. there as well nearby on the on the shores of the lake which is beautiful so people go there to see queen in a sense they to see the statue and to have a look around the studio and see what it was like so in response to that demand the um the casino and the town and some of our people put together this experience which is basically 
you. There's loads of our stuff there, instruments, and um, you can see where we worked. And in the control room, which has been restored to what it looked like when we were there, apart from it being filled with smoke, <laughs> uh, which was not easy, um, the desk has been restored, and you can sit there and you can mix a track. So you, there's a few Queen tracks there, and you can sit there and work the faders and do your own mix. Which That's really find. interesting. It's a nice thing, you know, so people... Um, I've seen them have a lot of fun with it. and Because um, that's yeah. part of the magic of, I think, of, you know, just as a music fan, what happens in the studio when people's individual parts become, you know, that thing that you, mm. that you love. Mm. Um, that must be amazing for people to actually have a go. What tracks are they, do you know? One of them is Made in Heaven, right. which is very much a very sort of quintessential queen track it's one of the biggest we ever did it was never a single strange enough it's one of my favorite was it not ever. no which perhaps it should be yeah yeah <laughs> made in heaven is so enormous we could play it if you like yeah let's have a listen Made in Heaven on Planet Rock, and my guest this week is Dr. Ryan May. <laughs> See, I got it right this time. Thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to talk to you really briefly, because I can't have you sitting here and not talk about the guitar. <laughs> I actually genuinely do not know how you ended up playing the guitar. Um, that, um, I genuinely don't know the story of, of how, how you ended up playing the guitar and not the drums or the piano. Oh, I see. What, what led you to, to <sighs> six strings? Well, Buddy Holly, really. I think that was the moment. I thought, ah, oh, that's what I want to do. When I heard that incredible jangling noise, I mean, we can play a bit of that if you like, you know I mean? Buddy Holly and the Crickets, I used to listen to on my little crystal set under the covers when I was pretending to be asleep, you know, and it was magic to me because in the world that I grew up in, it was the world of soft classical music and the big band era and Johnny Ray, ballads, Bing Crosby. And this guy coming along with this jangling sound and this amazingly kind of spooky sound of the backing harmonies as well. I, I was just blown away and I still am every time I hear it. From hearing that and thinking, right, that's what I want to do and actually putting that into practice, obviously lots of people dream of doing something but very few actually Mm. you know get to get to the end game once you actually got hold of a guitar how quickly did you realize actually i can do it i can do this i suppose it was gradually i mean i was lucky because my dad was musical and he taught me ukulele chords so when i asked for a guitar for my i don't know probably ninth or tenth birthday i got the guitar and i was able to make some kind of noise with it that made sense but for years i just played rhythm really and i would sing and play rhythm so that's my grounding and i i'm happy that that happened because these days people delve into you know playing only 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 uh very quickly you know people get into playing single notes but the rhythm stuff is very important that's your grounding really but yeah i could do something you know and you I had kids around me of my age who felt the same and were passionate about it. So we would go like and hide in the cycle sheds and play riffs to each other and swap ideas and, and techniques and stuff. So I, it happened very quickly. Um, you know, by the age of, I don't know, you know, 16 or so, I could play a lot of what I can play now. You know, you develop those skills quite quickly. But, you know, the inspiration was all around us. Rock and roll was just burgeoning everywhere. It's incredible. And, and I was listening to people like James Burton on um, Hello, Mary Lou, uh, Ricky Nelson Records. I didn't know his name. I didn't know who he was. I just heard this guitar, not just doing the jangling thing and not just making a big noise, but speaking. You know, he could bend notes, James Burton. And, you know, and I was just entranced because that transformed the guitar from a rhythm instrument into a a lead instrument on a parallel with a with a lead vocalist so that really just made the hairs on my back stand up and that's what i wanted to do do you want to play a buddy holly track then probably maybe baby okay yeah. let, let's have maybe baby i remember them so clearly these records because it was vinyl in those days and this was black vinyl done very cheap with a black label in the middle with very little on it except the title and the, the artist and they were in a brown paper bag <laughs> with a hole in it's very kind of cheapo but god the magic was in there you know and i can still smell what it was like you know <laughs> i have a perfume these vinyl singles and uh you know you put it on your record player and my god the magic just just leapt out at you well let's listen to buddy holly and maybe baby right after this my planet rocks on Planet Rock. I'll have you for me. It's 
Buddy Holly and Maybe Baby on Planet Rock. And my guest this week is Brian May. Brian, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your work with Kerry Ellis, because um, we've talked to you and Kerry before. But you, the two of you first met on We Will Rock You, didn't you? Well, she was the original she meet, was, yeah. Right. She came in to audition um, when we were putting the show together for the first time, you know, very tentatively, because we didn't really know what we were doing, you know. <laughs> we were learning very fast. But Kerry came in and, and sang uh, No One But You and just slaughtered us all. It was amazing. So she got the part. Um, I had actually seen her. I kind of uh, poached her, in a sense, because I'd seen her in My Fair Lady, of all things, something very different. But she was astounding in that as an understudy. And uh, so I, I think it was me who actually asked her to come in and audition for the part, which is incredible, and created that role. And I immediately thought, oh, this is the kind of voice I would like to work with, because, you know, I don't have Freddie anymore. And uh, she's just a very inspiring um, interpreter of material. So gradually, over years and years, we, because we're both incredibly busy, you know, we found time to just put some tracks together, produce some tracks for her, and we made that first album, the Anthems album. And then we uh, figured we could go out on tour. So we've, in various forms, we've been on tour, and it's great for me. It's very different. There's not the expectation of being queen, which is kind of a release for me. You know, I, I love being queen, but, you know, not all the time. Sometimes it's nice to get out and just be fresh and different. So we did our, the last thing we did was our acoustic by candlelight tour, which is great because it's very intimate. We can tell stories and have a joke with the audience and it's uh, turned out to be something very good. So we'll do some more of that. I think we start uh, around the end of February this year. Uh, doing some gigs in England. We have some gigs in Russia and in Malta, and I think maybe South Africa, I'm not sure. So um, I enjoy that, it's great, and, you know, it's it's stimulating for me. It's it's, um, it's a way of just having a very fresh look at, at things. We play a couple of Queen songs, and I do actually play some electric guitar, even though it's called Acoustic by Candlelight, but it's very intimate. It's mm. it's very different from the, the huge, grand Queen experience, which we may be doing again. You know, I think we may do some Queen gigs later on this year. I'm probably not supposed to say this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we're looking at doing something, you know. And, of course, Adam Lambert is a great front man, and we know already that that works, so we would be looking towards doing some gigs with Adam, hopefully. Uh, so I'm excited about that, if it happens, if it happens. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm going to make you hold that thought really quickly. I'm going to, and I'm going to ask you that a little bit more about that. Um, if you just pick me a track of you and Kerry's and then we'll, I'll ask you the big queen question. Yeah. Okay. The track I would pick is called Anthem and it's from the chess musical. And this is something which I grabbed hold of because I thought this is really a rock track and this is what I shall make it with Kerry and she's got this enormous voice and so we we did our own adaptation I'm very proud of this as an arrangement it's very rock you know it's got loads of loud guitars on it which is kind of what I do I suppose <laughs> it's also got a nice you know very big orchestral arrangement which I did with Steve Sidwell which I'm also very proud of and then on top of it sits Kerry with this extraordinary passionate delivery yeah so this is something we actually performed this at the festival of remembrance a couple of years ago and it was a great moment really this is the kind of thing which i strive for i love to make events happen you know and something special so um yeah this is anthem just said anthem on my planet rocks kerry ellis and, and brian may or brian brian may and kerry ellis i'm not sure which way around it can it be is. either way either yeah. way either way but <laughs> um oh, great stuff now just as we were talking then you sort of casually mentioned that there might be a little queen action later mm. on this year um wow <laughs> well we have a busy year coming up because we are doing this freddie musical and that's now you know the engine has started rolling and yeah. is this the, is that is that the biopic or is that the, yeah it's yeah. the biopic you know and it's about freddie and of course it has to be about us as well and um i think it's going to be a really interesting film you know we've been through various alleyways you know we've been through all kinds of thoughts as to what the film actually should be and i think it's now very clear to us we have a great director and we think we have a great guy playing freddie but we feel that we understand what our brief is now you know because it's a film about queen as a family in a sense because the as a group like us um forms organically in a sense you know we weren't put together from the outside we just evolved very luckily you know into a into a unit which democratically worked and organically um 
was creative you know and the sum of its parts were greater than the parts if you know what i mean mm. but also it's it's very much a family because we were together longer than any of our uh, you know relationships <laughs> outside our marriages and stuff you know and um and so the the film really is a kind of exploration of the dynamics of that kind of family and what happens how it comes together and how what happens when it gets disrupted and out of balance and how it can regain its integrity so it's a fascinating project really and i think the script is reflecting those thoughts and of course it's about freddy you know it's about how he functioned in this environment yeah and i'm and the thing is there's um uh, you know lots of people know that freddy you know the onstage freddy or, mm. or feel they know him because that was the only bit they saw yeah but i'm sure obviously you you knew him so well there must have been a million other facets of him yeah the freddy we knew was pretty shy really um but he had an extraordinary way of um of using his talents and also very good at bringing out other people's talents you know and that and by that i include me and, and and roger and john you know he was very he had a very generous nature i think and also a very far-seeing nature very focused because he realized that if he got the best out of everyone around him then it would benefit everyone so um yeah he's a very unusual person freddie mm, and fi and i guess finding someone to represent that is equally difficult i'm, I'm not going to make you yeah. tell me who it is but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the rumours are out there, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can Google it. Um, what about someone playing you? Um, have you ever had anyone play you before? No, not really. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. We have someone, I think, on the cards. You know, I don't... I probably can't reveal this either, but, you know, I'm excited about the guy who's, at the moment, uh, the front runner for playing me. Yeah, it's going to be weird. I mean, that is very weird. And I... To be honest, that's one of the things which has stopped us doing this before, I think. You know, I don't know if we were ready for this. I remember coming up with the same thing in the musical. You know, the musical originally, We Will Rock You, was going to be a bio musical. It was going to be about the history of Queen and stuff, you know, and the history of Freddie. And we actually workshopped it that way. And then we just hated it. We just didn't feel it was... It felt comfortable to portray us on stage that way. So that's why We Will Rock You became about the future and kids in the future. And thank God for Ben Elton, who had the vision to make it happen that way because we rock is much much more interesting than a than a sort of biographic musical i think and it's a good story you know it, it's um funny it's satirical but it has a warmth to it so i think when people come out from we will rock you they feel like they've kind of seen us and they know us in a strange way mm. And they feel like they've been on some kind of journey and they want to do it again. That's why We Rock You still there after 11 mm. years. Is there a track that appears in the show that we can play now? Seeing as we're talking about, we just talked about Freddie, we talked about, about We Will Rock You. What, what track should we play that appears in the, <laughs> in the musical? Well, I Want It All is interesting, you know, because I Want It All is, is, is a sort of cornerstone of, of the play, you know, of the, the story of the musical, because it's about um kids wanting it all you know and, and the song was about reaching out and and grasping what you want in life and really that's kind of the theme of uh, of we were rock you so it's funny how the songs that we had you know i want to break freeze another example you know the songs actually dovetailed into the into a story like this very easily because a lot of queen's music was about normal people like you and me are normal people you know with normal dreams and normal frustrations trying to grab the kernel of life so i want it all it sums that up quite well i want it all from queen who else on planet rock and my guest this week brian may and um dr brian may uh, <laughs> I, I, you got I, I, it right. I don't want to say it now without the doctor at the beginning. Um, <laughs> so we we were talking before about more li live Queen shows this year. How difficult is it to crank that machine back into action? Because I assume it's quite a machine. It's slightly frightening <laughs> because it's big. You know, as soon as the word Queen is over the top, then things change in scale. And we do have some great people we can call up. You know, but from the moment you press that button, you feel this sort of energy starting up again. You feel the the engine start to turn, and it's it's exciting. I mean, I can feel excitement in me at you know, the thought that we may be going out, and it's energizing. You know, it also brings brings other stuff. You know, being queen, sort of stepping back into that sort of battleground, <laughs> internal battleground. You know, is is not that easy for me. 
um because i'm used to getting my own way i suppose and roger and i always see things completely differently we're like brothers you know there's a certain amount of love there but there's a certain amount of hatred as well <laughs> not hatred but you know we pull in opposite directions the whole time which is partly the, the strength of queen i suppose but to step back into that arena can be quite hard for, i know for him as well as, as me we don't have john anymore you know because he's opted out you know he's quite reclusive really and we respect that we don't have freddie so you know here we are and i think there's always a big question mark you know a lot of people think oh we shouldn't be trying to be queen you know whatever but you know it's in us that's what we spent half our lives building and the demand is there people want to see queen in some form and we can give it someone like adam lambert comes along well, formerly paul rogers you know which was a great success but adam lambert is um I suppose a little bit more like Freddie in some ways, you know, he has that extraordinary sort of theatricality to him, which Freddie had as well. He, he doesn't copy Freddie in any sense whatsoever, which is great. I would hate to do it with a copyist. But Adam has an amazing range. He's one of the few singers in the world, male singers, who can handle all those vocals at their original pitch. And he's an entertainer. And he's nice to be around. You know, this is so important. You've got to work with people that you like and feel comfortable with um and he definitely qualifies for that so uh, you know if it happens this year it, it will be with adam and um well you know <laughs> i can feel the I can feel the warm draft beneath my feet you know? <laughs> <laughs> i like that's a good way to put it i was just thinking that it's kind of a shame that this isn't tv because just the look on your face then <laughs> yeah. something something changed but it, it uh, is kind of scary but you know most of the best things in life are scary aren't they yeah it makes you feel alive definitely mm. definitely well i think we will all and i probably speak for everyone here at planet rock as well to say that we will all will be there on the front row most definitely Brilliant. most definitely right. well thank you to planet rock because you, you do us good and we appreciate it well Wonderful. there wouldn't be much planet rock to be honest if um if it hadn't been for queen so thank you i think i say that from from that's our great. listeners as well oh, that's great but um well, i just want to play out with one track before we go and mm. uh, i think the last time you were really um on the airwaves on planet rock uh was with our good friend well no not not my good friend your good friend tony iomi ah, good friend great of the station. tony iomi yeah yeah tony's great he's he's one of my very few real friends in the business you know and he's a great 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 friend he's just i think you know one of the people who well obviously he's he's kind of the father of heavy metal really this man you know, came up with a million riffs which are the, the cornerstone of, of heavy metal music but he's totally modest you know he'd laugh if it, well he does laugh when i say that you know <laughs> and um in fact he has so many riffs that didn't get used we've talked about a project of putting those riffs all together uh, and, that rings um, a bell yeah it's it's something you know we haven't had time to do it yet but when we do get a moment that's what we're going to do is sit down in fact we've laid we've we've done some preparation and so you know there's a lot of these tracks we're going to listen to and he just had so many riffs that not all of them got converted into black Sabbath songs or even solo songs you know so we thought how interesting it would be to have this stuff out there and maybe other people can use them you know like uh, the lost riffs of rock they will love it yeah really <laughs> Tony Iommi's riffs how does he do it well shall we bring it well I'm going to bring it back to the beginning and I'm just going to remind everyone that your book Diablo E Di mm. Diablo is. I'm yeah, going to say it in, a, in a northern yeah. accent uh, so yeah. <laughs> that's the only way I know um, Brian's book Diablo is, is out now and Stereoscopic Adventures in Hell and I think a good sort of soundtrack for that would be a Black Sabbath track I think what it do you would think? yeah so what should we play out with I wouldn't mind paranoid myself, actually. It just always does it, doesn't it, really? Yeah, let's have a Is that okay? Are we allowed? I, I think we are 100% <laughs> allowed, and I'm sure Tony will, will be pleased. Brian, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you on my phone. Thank you. Brilliant. Nice to be here. Yeah.